for the evening. Um, thank you all for coming to hear Peter Osborne. Uh, just before I introduce Peter, I'd like to say that Anna, Anna Colin, who had to cancel for illness a couple of weeks ago, was needed to find back in May. So I'll let you know when we find the date on that. So Peter Osborne teaches at the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University. He has been a consultant to the education program at Tate Britain and was involved as a co-curator with regard to Norway's involvement in the 2011 Venice Biennale. And for 30 years, he's been at the center of the journal Radical Philosophy. Peter's books include Anywhere or Not at All, Philosophy of Contemporary Art, and that is um, this book here, from which uh, an extract is on the BLE um, for you to read. And uh, another book, Spheres of Action, Art and Politics. Both of these were published last year. The State of Things was published in 2012. The Politics of Time, Modernity, and Avant Garde, 1995-2010. Marx, 2005. Conceptual Art, 2002. And Philosophy and Cultural Theory, 2000. He also edited the three volume Walter Benjamin, Critical Evaluations in Cultural Theory, from 2005. He has written catalog essays for Tate Modern, Sydney Biennale, Walker Art Centre Minneapolis, Icon Birmingham, and the Norwegian National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design. And Peter has written on contemporary art for journals like, that include Art for All, Art History, October, and the Oxford Art Journal. So please join me in welcoming Peter Osborne. Thanks very much, Mark. Can you hear me with this? It's slightly croaky as usual. So if I start to wander off, I need to uh, make a sign of the back that I've become uh, inaudible. Um, just say something about um, my title, my slightly forbidding title, Transcendental Narrativity and the Problem of the Future. I apologize for its slightly forbidding character. Uh, it's the kind of title that, um, that you give people when they, when they ask you for a title six months ahead. And you think you've got a really long time to think about it. Uh, and you plan to have some very big thoughts. Um, so I'm slightly a hostage to it. Uh, but I will nonetheless address it, although only really explicitly in the second part of this talk. Um, and primarily uh, by expounding it uh, as a kind of problematic, that is to say a certain structure of problems that gives meaning to the concepts within a particular theory, uh, rather, than as, uh, rather than by having a, a strong position uh, internally to that problematic. Um, the reason that I'm going to uh, only come on to this in the second half of the talk uh, is that there's a sense in which, in which it's a kind of regional problematic of a broader, uh, a much wider framework or a kind of model, we could call it a model or a framework uh, for the philosophical interpretation of contemporary art. So I think I need to start uh, with some general remarks about <coughs> the kind of philosophical interpretation of contemporary art, and more specifically, the kind of uh, philosophical criticism of contemporary art in a kind of post-Adorno mode, uh, within which I'm going to locate problems about narrativity uh, and the future. Um, and in this respect, I'm, I will in passing address, address some of the more broader issues in this series, like questions about criticality, but particularly questions about the meaning of the contemporary and its, its alleged historicization, because I'm, there's a few things I'd like to say about that. And since I'm aware that um, parts of my book have a certain forbidding character, non-philosophical um, reader, uh, I'll, 
try and <coughs> expand aspects and a few concepts from it in a very general and um, slightly loose slightly loose way, uh, in part by taking the opportunity to address what I take to be some kind of common misunderstandings about this kind of philosophical criticism of art that have been kind of helpfully staged uh, in various ways by reviews of my book, so that I'm now, I'm now more aware, if you like, of what are the uh, like the common elements uh, of interpretation that I, that I wish to disavow. Um, so I'm going to make some remarks about the philosophy of art, then I'm going to talk about transcendental narrativity and the futural dimension of transcendental narrativity. And then at the end, uh, I want to make some slightly more specific remarks, but really as a way of opening up into the discussion uh, about the concept of artistic form as the mediation uh, of the multiple temporalities and hence multiple narratives of a work uh, and the relationship between uh, the question of form uh, as the mediation of multiple temporalities and the question of what for Adorno is the subject-like character of the work of art. So I want to talk a little bit about the concept of the subject uh, of the work of art as a subject because it's the subject-like character uh, of the work of art that uh, on the Adornian model uh, is what ontologically differentiates art from uh, other things and other kinds of cultural artifacts, uh, including uh, its own uh, materiality or its own literality. The, uh, the opacity of that thing like literality of its own materials, on the other hand, is nonetheless for Adorno equally necessary to the artistic status of the work. So that there's a kind of, there's an unresolved dialectic uh, in Adorno between the subject-like quality of all art and the thing-like quality of all art. Uh, I thought it might be useful to say a few words about that, given the um, fashionability of certain confused ideas about objects and things that has currently found its way into the old world, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to do that uh, at the end, just in relation to a short clip of film from uh, a 2005 film by, uh, you're probably familiar with this, by uh, Akram Satari, uh, who has an exhibition that just opened at Vars and Brussels, uh, and who was also uh, shown some of the work that's in that exhibition uh, in the Lebanese pavilion that was in the Arsenal in the last Venice Biennale. But this is an earlier work from 2005 called In This House, but it's a work that um, parts of which get uh, recycled through a number of later works, both uh, in relation to their documentary material and in relation to, in relation to certain narratives. Um, one reason that I'm interested in, in this work is that a kind of extension uh, in a slightly different mode of my interest in the Atlas group uh, is as an example of what we might call art documentary. Uh, and it functions in some ways uh, in an inverted manner in relation to the Atlas Group. Because whereas the Atlas Group is functioning, is, uh, is operating with fictionalized documentary materials, and if you like, playing on the documentary character of the materials to give some kind of historical indexicality to the fiction. What's at stake in the kind of art documentary material uh, that uh, Satari works with, and particularly in this, this particular film, uh, is the inverse move, where you're using, uh, if you like, formally strictly documentary material. Uh, but it's documentary material which in some way becomes fictionalized by virtue of the mode of its narrative presentation. 
So if there's a kind of move in the, the Atlas group, or if you like to use fiction for documentary purposes, there's a kind of use of documentary, uh, non-fictional documentary, by Zatari for uh, narrative purposes which, uh, if you like, exploit uh, the devices of fictional narrative. So that what, uh, what both bodies of work have in common is that they're, like, they're approaching from different angles. What, from a, a philosophical point of view, appears as the point of indifference between historical and fictional narratives. Uh, one of the things I'm going to suggest when I make a few remarks about the philosophy of time uh, is following, uh, following Paul, Paul Ricoeur is that the concept of narrative itself is, if you like, constituted as the transcendental point of indifference between fiction and history. Um, and, and if that's the case, uh, that's one reason why uh, this work, uh, both at the Atlas Group and then in the inverted form by Zatari, is working uh, at a, an interface, if you like, that has a, uh, a very particular and very deep philosophical investment uh, built into uh, the structural position of this, uh, this moment, this narrative, this common narrative, moment of indifference between fiction and history. And one of the things I want to suggest in a, kind of, in a slightly speculative way is that there's an ontological sense in which all art depends upon the truth, if you like. Uh, the truth of art depends always, in some sense, upon exploiting or having a relation to this moment of indifference between fiction and history. Uh, so one of the things I want to do in relation to the broadly Adornian uh, problematic that I'm working out of uh, is suggest that in the context of uh, photographic uh, film work, particularly lay with relations to documentary, over the, la the last few decades, in other words, since Adorno's death, uh, we find uh, that what the, if you like, the, what appears in a very conventional mode within Adorno's aesthetic theory as the concept of aesthetic illusion, which I'll talk about a bit, and which gets taken up by uh, philosophers who like Adorno in a very conventional way in relation to Kant, um, that there's, there's a sense in which we can translate uh, this concept of aesthetic illusion into a discourse uh, about fictionality uh, and consequently into a discourse about the relationship between fiction and history uh, and narrative as the point of indifference, the general structure of narrativity. Uh, as the point of indifference between uh, between fiction and history, that's the uh, that's the broad idea. basic concepts and a number of uh, problems associated with them or problems that are inherent in them and problems that people have with them. Uh, and the three basic concepts are, ph are philosophy, history, and the contemporary. <coughs> and the four Four particular problems uh, I want to just mention that I think are inherent 
within the very idea of an explicitly philosophical criticism of contemporary art, and which are certainly, if you like, experienced as problematic um, by those who are not particularly sympathetic to a philosophical criticism of contemporary art, uh, are as follows. Uh, the first has to do with the discourse, the historically received discourse of philosophy, and three aspects of that discourse in particular. Firstly, uh, its externality to other discourses, it's by virtue of its historical preconstitution. Secondly, it's its consequent apparent self-sufficiency, uh, which it uh, historically defends in some way, at least in a disciplinary manner, uh, in terms of the self-sufficiency of purely intellectual, sorry, purely conceptual discourse, right? which is obviously a problem in an art context. Uh, and thirdly, it's apparently a hierarchalizing, privileging uh, of its own discourse in relation to other discourses. So the, these are all, if you like, three aspects of what might be thought of um, in another mode. Uh, as, as, if you like, the basis of the cultural elitism of philosophical discourse in relation to other discourses. And it's in some ways overbearing relation to those discourses. The second problem, uh, which again relates to the classical history of philosophical discourses, although most contemporary uh, philosophy uh, disavows this problem because it disavows uh, its relationship to it, but obviously for someone like Adorno, it's, it's completely constitutive. Um, the second problem is what appears to a lot of people as the overburdening of art with metaphysical demands. Right? In other words, the subjection of contemporary art practices to discourses that still have a strong relation to classical metaphysical concepts of truth. Right? But there seems to be, from the point of view of those skeptical about these discourses, if you like, an enormous historical and cultural gulf you know, between those discourses and the modes of experience associated with contemporary art. This is it. This I think is probably the main, uh, the main problem, uh, the main like, phenomenologically the, the, the main problem that has to be overcome for anyone who wants to develop like philosophical criticism of contemporary art that they're going to make convincing uh, to people uh, closer to its practice than to the intellectual discourses about it. Third problem. Third problem uh, is the problematic relation of philosophical discourses to, an, to analyses of individual works. Uh, this is partly the consequence <coughs> of the apparently pure conceptuality of philosophical discourses on the one hand, uh, and the particularity, even discourses of the aesthetic, discourses which are, if you like, about the sensuous particularity of art. One of the, one of the <coughs> kind of auto-destructive ironies of philosophical aesthetics, which is not a, a discourse I wish to defend, I wish to defend philosophical art criticism, not philosophical aesthetics. One, one of the auto-destructive ironies of philosophical aesthetics is that it is, if you like, a purely conceptual discourse about a purely sensuous experience. Right. It's, a, it's a kind of uh, paradoxical or self-contradictory. Um, the, the consequence of the gap, uh, the manifestation of the gap between philosophical discourse and contemporary art practice at the level of individual works, uh, it manifests itself in relation to analyses of individual works. Uh, in, one, in one of two ways, it tends to mean that Philosophical analyses of individual works 
either in danger, and this is the main danger, of being merely illustrative of the uh, theories that they're propounding on the one hand, uh, and where they're not illustrative of the theories, they're in danger of being irrelevant to the work. Right? They're in danger, in some sense, of missing the work completely. So that's the third problem. As you can see, I'm going to make this like really bad in order that I can then persuade you that it's going to be all right. Um, and the third, uh, sorry, the fourth problem uh, is that philosophy of art seems to prejudge the question of the autonomy of art and use it as a philosophical criterion, uh, where the question of the autonomy of art, or in particular, the question of the autonomy or not of individual works and the desirability or not of their autonomy, given the character of their practice, is something which is, if you like, at stake in contemporary art. And so the argument would go, can't uh, be subjected to autonomy as a critical criterion. This is, this is one of the main critical issues, I think. Uh, but I think it derives from uh, a misunderstanding, at least, of, of some concepts of autonomy. Okay, so those are the four. Um, those are the four problems. I'm just going to say something uh, in response to those problems to try to uh, to mitigate those problems. <coughs> so the first problem, which is the this external self-sufficiency and hierarchical privileging of um, philosophy in relation to art. Uh, it's a problem that is famously summed up in the, uh, the fragment of uh, Friedrich Schlegel that Adorno intended to use as the epigram of uh, aesthetic theory. And it's interesting that the editors are endlessly referring to the fact that he intended to use it as the epigram. But when they construct the book, they don't use it as the epigram. It's a bit peculiar. Um, they mess around with the book in various other ways. It suggests that the editors are slightly uh, anxious about this epigram in some way. Uh, and the famous epigram I'm sure you're familiar with from Schlegel is, uh, and this is from the uh, the end of the 1790s. Okay, so it's from whatever, 200, nearly 220 years ago. What is called philosophy of art usually lacks one of two things: either the philosophy or the art. Um, and essentially, uh, Adorno believed, and I think he, he's probably right, that this, this in some sense has remained broadly true for the last 200, 220 years, right? Um, consequently, if you like, the aspiration, the, the theoretical aspiration of the philosophy of art uh, must be to, in some sense, avoid either of those two crushing alternatives, that is to say, to lack either the philosophy or the art. Uh, if you like, the redeeming possible moment in the Schlegel aphorism, uh, and I think he's, he's, uh, he's thinking about Schelling, I think, when he writes this, um, is that it says what is called philosophy of art usually uh, lacks, that is to say, there ought to be something else, and this is, if you like, the space into which I'm trying to write. There ought to be something else you could call the philosophy of art that would not do that. The interesting thing is that historically, insofar as the, the kind of philosophy of art that doesn't do that exists, which I think it does, um, it, is, it, is found, it is found uh, in places other than disciplinary discourses of philosophy. In other words, it's not found in explicitly philosophies of art, explicit philosophies of art or philosophical aesthetics. It's primarily found uh, in what are institutionally non-philosophical places, specifically uh, in that tradition that begins with Schlegel's uh, fragments themselves, which appear in, if you like, uh, an ambiguously literary philosophical form. Uh, and which runs in like, the modern tradition through Baudelaire, who we have to count, I think, as the first uh, philosopher of the modern, 
in an intellectual sense, uh, through, um, through Walter Benjamin, and then to a certain degree into Adorno himself. Although, of course, it's one of the ironies of Adorno that there's a sense in which, despite his uh, acute self-consciousness of these problems about the uh, self-alienating character of philosophical discourse, most of his later work takes the form of re-rendering uh, Walter Benjamin's philosophy back into a strictly philosophical discourse, uh, from which, it, if you like, it, it has Slagle, the problem that Slagle identifies uh, in the first place. Uh, in relation to that in the 1960s, the place in which one finds, if you like, a philosophy of art in a practical state, in, in uh, non-disciplinary philosophical discourse, is, of course, in the body of writing by conceptual artists that you get from uh, around about 1962 through to the mid-70s. through to the mid So if, you, if you're looking for, if you like, a philosophical tradition in non-philosophical places, I would want to argue that that's the continuation of that, uh, that tradition. Okay. What this means is, uh, the consequence of this recognition in relation to philosophical discourse is that only some kind of transdisciplinary philosophical discourse, rather than a disciplinary philosophical discourse, has any hope of constituting the concept of art in a way that is adequate to its practices and the other non-philosophical discourses which surround them and constitute them. Uh, but philosophy appears here in a, like a dangerous uh, double mode. That's to say, uh, in relation to a discourse about the transdisciplinary constitution of art, uh, which I want to defend, philosophy is nonetheless in danger of playing a double role. It's in danger of playing the role of one of the multiplicity of discourses through which the concept of art is constituted, on the one hand, and also a meta-disciplinary, transdisciplinary discourse which thinks the unity of them, which of course then reconstitutes uh, the, the meta-status of philosophy. And that's the problem uh, with discourses about transdisciplinarity. But if you think about, if you like, the history of the constitution of the concept of art, uh, it's clear that, if you like, the concept of art has no, if you like, disciplinary place of constitution. Um, the concept of art is constituted across and in the relations between at least five discourses since the 18th century, obviously. History of art, aesthetics, philosophy of art, art criticism, which is in some way, uh, for me, the privileged moment in these discourses because it's the, uh, it's the discourse which is constituted by its relations to the presence of its utterance, that is the discourse which is most uh, self-conscious about its living status. Uh, and then finally, obviously, for the latter part of the 20th century, sociology of art or, or cultural theories of art. Uh, you won't really, you won't be able to constitute a concept of art without in some way writing a kind of constellated history of at least those, uh, at least those five, five disciplines. So that's the, um, that's the way of, if you like, finessing the problem of the autonomy and self-sufficiency of philosophical discourse, which is simply to say it's, if you like, it's not philosophically uh, tenable, if you like. Philosophy has to give up its own autonomy, its uh, critical discourse, not just in relation to art, but in relation to anything. That's, uh, that's the lesson of the Frankfurt School, really. That's what remains the lesson of the Frankfurt School. In the face of the re uh, of criticism by French philosophers of the book, from which all kinds of new classicisms, be they Deleuzean, Badulian, or speculative, or realist or anything else, uh, all once more descend upon art from the heavens and are loved by art, the art world. It's a kind of masochistic love, I think. Um, okay, that's the first point. The second one I'm going to be much more, much uh, more brief about. 
which is to do with uh, the overburdening of art with metaphysical claims, because this is this is the core issue. Uh, and in a way, uh, it's easier to deal with it in relation to the concept of history, because it's through the concept of history, uh, through the concept of the historical intelligibility of art, that the question of metaphysics, if you like, manifests itself most directly in critical discourse. So the question of metaphysics here is not the question, uh, it's not the speculative realists uh, the Badurian questions about classical ontology. The question of metaphysics in relation to art is the question of what uh, uh, the way Adorno, Adorno formulated what it is. After the, the materialist critique of metaphysics, the question of metaphysics migrates to the question of uh, the possibility of metaphysical experience. And it turns out that for Adorno, the question of, met of the possibility of metaphysical experience comes in two forms. Firstly, the form of the question of the possibility of the experience of history as a, as a collective singular metaphysical concept. And particularly, the question of the possibility of the experience of art as the experience of history. So the question of metaphysics in relation to contemporary art is the question of the possibility of experiencing contemporary art, primarily for its historical intelligibility. In other words, to experience contemporary art as itself an articulation of historical experience. And that's the, um, that's the line I want to go around. That's not a, um, a question of possibility. It's not a question that can be, if you like, empirically falsified insofar as the gulf between the majority of contemporary art and the artistic articulation of historical experience is not a refutation of the question of its possibility. Uh, the question is whether any contemporary art can do that. Uh, if some contemporary art can do that, then if you like that possibility is in a certain way uh, redeemed the question that remains for people who uh, don't believe that it can, or don't want to, uh, like, in some way critically validate that art, even if they believe that it can. So you could take that position and say, some art does, some art doesn't, but I don't validate the art that does. In a way, the question of uh, the question to which the question of metaphysical, uh, the metaphysical demand on art regresses uh, is really the question of what is the distinct what is the value of distinctively artistic practice what is the cultural value of distinctively artistic practice if it does not reside in some residually metaphysically invested form of historical experience okay what distinguishes those practices and those modes of experience from any other and consequently thereby why should there be any art institutions? Right? Um, it's possible, of course, that soon there won't be any art institutions. Um, but that's a deeper problem. <laughs> <laughs> Which is itself imminently related to history. <laughs> OK, uh, third problem. The problem of the relation of philosophical discourses uh, to individual works. This is the problem of illustration. I just want to say something. The problem of irrelevance is always there. Um, the problem of illustration uh, is also a big problem in philosophical discourses as well. I just want to feel like state the Adornian principle about the relation between individual analyses of individual works. Sorry, my voice is completely disappearing. <coughs> analyses of individual works uh, and the concept of art. And then just give an example. Uh, the relevant quotation from, from Adorno is, the unity of art is not abstract, rather it presupposes concrete analyses, not as proofs and examples, but as its own condition. This is the important thing, in other words, it's, it's an inversion of the relation of illustration. Okay. In other words, the argument is that the construction of the concept of art, or the construction of particular aspects of the concept of art, 
the construction of Wagner's critical concept in relation to particular works uh, relates to those works, whereby those works don't offer proofs or examples of the theoretical construction, rather the analysis of the individual works must function as presuppositions of the uh, theoretical analysis. So to give you an example um, from my own book, um, one common a critical response to the book is, is to say, yeah, there's a lot of, I'm not sure I like this philosophy stuff, but I like the analyses of the individual works. Right? That's okay. I can live with the analyses of the individual works, but we don't need the, we don't need the theory. Right? Or to say, yeah, the analyses of the individual works, right, but they illustrate the theory, which is the common problem. Um, it's, I shouldn't be more explicit about this. It's meant to work the other way around. To give you an example of the way in which analysis of an individual work can function as the condition of the theory, one way of reading uh, the first chapter of my book, which is about the Atlas group and the question of the fictionality of the contemporary, is to say well, that was a really easy example because it was the Atlas group. So, of course, it demonstrates the fictionality of the contemporary. Uh, but the constructive point works the other way around, which is that I got to the concept of the fictionality of the contemporary out of the analysis of the Atlas group. Right? In other words, it's the analysis of the body of work of the Atlas group that produced the concept of the fiction of the contemporary, which then becomes a generalizable theoretical concept to take and try and look at uh, the limits of its generality in relation to the analysis of, of other individual works. So the notion of the fictionality of the contemporary is the theoretical concept produced by the Atlas group. So the critical claim is not that I have this theory and it explains the Atlas group. The critical, the critical claim is the Atlas group's work is significant because it, it produces this critical concept. Right? Uh, and if you want, if you like, a strong uh, philosophical criteria for the criticality of an individual work, or a body of work, which would be fair body of work, it would be, if you like, what concept does that work produce which is needed in order to interpret it? In other words, what concept does it produce which you need to that to understand the work, which is of sufficient generality to then also un allow you to understand a certain other body of work? And if you like, the more work, the greater the generality of the concept produced by the work, in order to understand that work, the greater the critical significance of the work. That's the criterion, right? So the claim that I make in the, the reason that is the Atlas group that gets discussed in the first chapter of a book subtitled Philosophy of Contemporary Art is because my claim is that there is a concept produced by that work, which is, if you like, the most general concept, critical concept, which allows us to understand questions about the contemporary humanity of art in general. Right? Uh, similarly, so in relation to the uh, these Atari works, I'm just going to show a very brief clip on. If I haven't, I haven't developed a reading of this work yet, but at the back of my mind is the idea that somewhere inside this work, because of, it, or because of this in, in, indifference that it trades on between between fiction and history, somewhere in this work is, if you like, an artistic working of the notion of narrativity, yeah, which will allow us, if you like, to think a much larger body of contemporary work in relation to its narrative dimension. And not just work which presents itself as narrative. That's the point. Right? The point is that narrativity is a very general transcendental concept. Uh, so that there's a move here, if you like, from narration to narrativity. And the critical significance of the work, if it could be sustained, would be that it's operating as a reflection on the narrativity of narrative. Right? Like the constitutive temporal structure of narrative itself. Okay, fourth problem. Uh, the prejudgment of autonomy is a uh, as a philosophical criteria. 
Um, in relation to a kind of broadly critical theoretical uh, concept of autonomy, and certainly in Adorno, uh, autonomy is not a philosophical presupposition of, of the work. Autonomy operates at two levels, neither of which, uh, if you like, is a conceptual presupposition. They're both, uh, one is a historical presupposition and the other is a critical result. The first level at which the concept of autonomy works uh, is at the level of the, the social relations of the art institutions uh, as a discrete institutional form that, if you like, separate themselves out from other institutions. So if you like, simply the, what in a kind of, what someone like Lumen would call the artistic subsystem, the sociological existence of a discrete set of institutional relations is the historical condition of autonomy. That, like, <coughs> art, only, art only functions autonomously within the terms of the, that institutionality. Right? The institutionality doesn't produce the autonomy of the individual work, but it's a condition of the autonomy. That's the, that's the sense in which there's a big difference between Adorno and Benjamin. Because in a sense, Benjamin wants to treat everything as if it's autonomous. In a sense, he wants to produce autonomous, uh, autonomy through a kind of interpretive act to, to just to, to, to decontextualize any cultural or historical object or process. And by decontextualizing it, by separating it, it from its practical context, produce it as an object of interpretation. Adorno, on the other hand, wants to emphasize that that's, if you like, a historical process based on institutions uh, and that uh, if you do it solely interpretively, uh, you're in danger of producing what uh, appears in other contexts as something like the, the fallacy of the sophisticated reading, that is to say. It's something that cultural studies often does, um, which is, if you like, constitutes an object with a reading so sophisticated it bears no relation to the practice of the object that it's interpreting. Right? Um, the virtue of the institution analysis is it keeps the object located in the institutional relations of the practice. Autonomy becomes a critical concept, not at the level of the institution, nor at the level of the philosophical discourse. It becomes a critical concept at the level of the capacity of the individual work to demonstrate its autonomy. So no individual work is, if you like, constituted a priori as autonomous by the institution. The institution and the institutional relations provide the conditions under which it's possible to produce an autonomous work. That's the second point. Uh, and the third and decisive point, which I'll come back to at the end, but which I think is, is more or less wholly missed uh, in the interpretation of this concept of autonomy, uh, is precisely what autonomy is. Because autonomy uh, in Adorno is double, and it's connected to this question of aesthetic illusion, uh, which I want to connect to the question of fictionality. The autonomy of the work uh, within the Adornian framework is the capacity of the work to produce the illusion of autonomy. Right? This is an important thing. A work is autonomous if it can produce the illusion of autonomy. What that means is, so this is a concept of, of autonomy that does not believe philosophically in the autonomy of the work. Okay? It believes in the work's capacity to produce illusions of autonomy. Yeah? And what we mean by autonomy is the capacity to produce that illusion. And it's that illusion which, within the Adornian framework, goes by the name of art. Right? It's that illusion which, if you like, distinguishes the art character of the work from other more literal non-art elements and from other non-artistic works. And that's why, if you like, one can transcode this question of fictionality at the level of the constitution uh, of the concept of modern art in its institutional form, if you believe that what is meant by art is that which, under certain institutional conditions, produces the illusion of its own autonomy. Uh, I'll come back to 
this, but this relates to the question of the subject, because what it means to be able to produce the illusion of autonomy, what it means to confront a viewer with the illusion that the work is autonomous, namely that if you like, autonomous, it produces its own meaning, that the work is if you like a self-sufficient producer of meaning. That's what autonomy is. The illusion that that's what the work does. In order for the work to function autonomously, another way of saying the same thing is that the, is that the work functions like a subject. Right? That is to say, it behaves as if it is, if you like, some kind of self-legislating entity. So works of art on this model are, are kind of strange, objectified versions of liberal individuals. Indeed, it follows from Adorno's social theory that works of art are more like the philosophical model of a liberal individual than people who think they are liberal individuals. Right? That is to say, the illusion of autonomy created by, by the work <coughs> is closer to the notion of autonomy than human individuals and capitalist societies are to their own illusion of their own autonomy. So there's two, there's two illusions of autonomy here. There's the work's capacity to be autonomous by producing the illusion of autonomy. This is what we could call the good illusion, right? This is art as good illusion. And then there's liberal political theory and everyday life, which is our own illusion that we are autonomous subjects. That's the bad illusion. That's the one that we suffer from. So there's a strange inversion here. It's because works of art in their illusory autonomy are closer in their actuality to the political model of the liberal individual than human individuals in capitalist societies. That Adorno associates the political future with the work of art. That Adorno, if you like, politically valorizes art as the prefiguration of a free praxis. Because in some paradoxical and mysterious but fundamental sense, once produced and put to work under the conditions of the art institution, Artworks really do function more like free individuals than human beings actually function. Right? So the strong claim is that's actually true. Your art is freer than you are. Which is in some sense obviously so, right? <laughs> A chastening fact, nonetheless. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to, because I'm taking a very long time to do this, I'm going to say something about um, the contemporary, and then I'll go and just show this. This and we can talk about whether uh, whether we think transcendental narrativity is at stake in the digging of a hole in the ground in the garden. In the um, so I'm going to skip the section about history, but you know that history is what's at stake, if you like, metaphysically. Um, the reason that I want to say something about the contemporaries is because I need to say something about time in order to explain uh, the concept of futurity and of the future that is at stake in the concept of narrative uh, and the concept of narrativity. Uh, so I need, to, uh, I need to distinguish what I'm calling the contemporary or contemporaneity within the purview of a metaphysical concept of history from 
what galleries in Cork Street call the contemporary, and what various of the reviews of my book have called the contemporary. And this is not a, like, how can this be a philosophy of contemporary art that the reviewer said because there's no works discussed later than 2006. This is to fundamentally misunderstand the concept of the contemporary. Um, but it's an important misunderstanding. Uh, one, one way to um, <coughs> way to expand this philosophically and incredibly crudely and swiftly uh, is, to, uh, is to take a conventional philosophical distinction uh, between time on the one hand and temporality on the other hand. And then to apply this distinction, firstly to history, uh, and then to the notion of contemporaneity, uh, and, then, and then to see how it functions in relation to narrative. Um, essentially, this, this traditional philosophical distinction between uh, time and temporality um, is complicated. But the way, the way that uh, the easiest way to uh, to expand it, it's firstly to say that within, if you like, the tradition of 20th century and subsequent philosophy is distinguished by the idea of the primacy, that the, if you like, the ontological, the existential ontological primacy of temporality over time. Time on this model, in a sense, is an old and cosmological concept that can be found, summarized very briefly. In Book Four of Aristotle's Physics, where it appears as, in its classical definition, as the number of motion <coughs> in relation to before and after, or you could retranslate that in slightly different ways: the measurement of motion, or the quantification of motion in relation to before and after. So that if you like, so. Time is constituted on this model as an infinite succession of instances which has directionality by virtue of the capacity to, to relate one instant to another, either by the fact that it occurs before or after it. Okay. So in other words, think of probably what you think of as time normally, right? Some kind of linear chronological succession of instances. Temporality, on the other hand, is a, kind of, is a concept which comes from deepening of a phenomenological concept of time where the primary temporal relations are not before and after. The, time, the primary temporal relations are past, present, and future. And time is the articulated unity of the process of differentiation between past, present, and future. And what makes temporality, if you like, different from time is the temporality is irreducibly phenomenological. In order to produce tenses, to produce a tense discourse, in other words, in order to produce a discourse that uses verb tenses, you need to have a phenomenological concept of time. That's to say, a concept of time that is ultimately located in the presence of the utterer of the, of the I, in the presence of a subject. Yeah. In other words, all, all relations of past, present, and future are relative to the presence of some subject in the formal grammatical sense of a subject, uh, or even an ontological sense of a grammatical subject, illusory or not, as that which utters the I in a sentence. The point about this distinction is that the process, the constant process of differentiation of unif and unification between the past and the present and the future through which uh, time flows produces what, what, we can be, what could the future as what we could be called futurity. In other words, the directedness of the present towards the openness of the present that hasn't yet happened. Yeah. But the futurity 
is, if you like, in the existential modality of the relation between, or of the way in which the future transcends the present and the past. There's various different ways, various different terms you can use for that. Uh, Augustine called it expectation. Husserl called it horizon. Uh, Heidegger called it anticipation. There's lots of technically very different descriptions of this. Um, but the point is that it's, a, uh, it's an ontologically embedded relational temporal process. Whereas if we think about the future in relation to time, we think of simply of the future as time which has not yet occurred. Yeah, which is probably the way you think about the future generally in everyday life, right? The future is time that has not yet occurred, which is philosophically rather more problematic because of the ontological status of time that has not yet occurred is uncertain in the sense that it has not yet occurred. That's to say it is inexistent and this leads to <coughs> philosophical problems about the future. But these philosophical <coughs> problems about the future are not suffered by temporalized notions of futurity. And politics, essentially, one could say, is about negotiating the relationship between futurity at the level of the act and futures at the level of like images of the way people would like time that has not yet occurred to be. Okay? So all politics is, uh, involves a negotiation between the specific futurity of an act which produces a future uh, and images of the future which are you know, like associated with time rather than temporality. Uh, so in relation to history, we can talk about the, the difference between history in a kind of degraded uh, Philosophical sense, which is what people call the history of the historians. I hope there aren't too many historians here, which includes the history of the art historians um, who labour with this <coughs> bad, dull chronological concept of time and think that history belongs to the past and that the way you write history is by reconstructing the past. These are all philosophical illusions of one kind or another. And some notion of historical temporality as the production at the level of the geopolitical whole of new sets of relations between, between human beings at the level of the whole. Okay, so it's like it's a practical process. So in relation to the notion of contemporaneity, contemporaneity in, if you like, the bad Cork Street sense means that portion of time that happened very recently, you know, that, that portion of time that happened very recently, uh, and into which hopefully you can invest sufficient up to dateness uh, to sell some work that has been recently produced before it becomes unsaleable, essentially. It's like a window of opportunity, it's a kind of marketing window. And obviously one of the ironies of the contemporaries that it, it, in the bad sense is it repeats the logic of the modern in the sense that it gets shorter and shorter. Right? So gallerists and art students get more anxious <laughs> because of the amount of time you, know, you have, which is why art schools have started uh, setting their directors targets and the number of students they can place with galleries within three years of their graduating, because it being considered that in a way a, a student who's not placed with a gallerist within three years will never be an artist. This will constitute a performance failure on the part of the art school. This is where we are with the, with this discourse. Uh, contemporaneity, on the other hand, at the level of uh, the notion of temporality, is the word for the structured interconnectedness uh, of historical processes within, within the terms of the lifetime 
of a living individual. So if you're not sleeping like, if you like, the durational rhythm of contemporaneity in its classical sense is to do with the lifetimes of generations, living individual generations rather than if you like generations of technology. One, what's happened with the degraded sense of the contemporary is that the concept of generation, what's happened is that the living the human individual has been replaced, if you like, by the software addition as the measure of a generation. So we speak of generations of software, yeah. uh, after which you know, your system is out of date and you'll have to buy a new computer. That happens more quickly. Uh, so that's the concept of contemporaneity which is functioning in the art world. The concept of contemporaneity, if you like, in relation to the living individual uh, is ironically getting longer uh, because we're living longer. So ironically, there's a kind of in a double relation here. The, the historical contemporaneity, uh, the rhythm of historical contemporaneity is, is getting longer as the techno market rhythm gets shorter. Now, if we take this distinction between time and temporality and history and historical temporality and the contemporary in these different forms, and you, you put the concept of narrative, the concept of narrative form, which I finally arrived at two minutes before my end. If you put the concept of narrative form into that conceptual framework, what you get is a distinction between a conventional concept of narrative uh, as the tensed articulation of the relations between the elements of a story, yeah? where, if you like, narrative overcodes chronological time with the time of events. So that whereas in chronological time, if you like the bad time of the historians, the idea that if you like each instance is in some way quantitatively equal, the idea that you're being scientific if you think every day is in some sense an equal historical significance is another day. The temporality of narrative overcodes uh, the chronological time of history with the time of the event. So a narrative only moves forward when there is an event. Okay. In other words, time can go on for many periods in narratives. So we can have five years between chapter four and chapter five. And the reason we can have five years between chapter four and chapter five and then have 200 pages on two days is because nothing narratively significant happened in the six years that was between the chapters. Right? So narrative is a time of meaning that is constituted by relation to the event. <coughs> and this is the basic philosophical meaning of the concept of event. Right? Uh, it's, it's worth bearing this in mind in relation to various philosophies of event. Classically, an event is that which drives a narrative forward, or another way of putting it is, an event, an event is something which temporizes time. Yeah? An event moves time forward. It's an event is not something that happens in time. An event is actually the act of moving time on. You know, events move time, so time on. So at the level of the, uh, the concept of temporality, this overcoding, like this tense narrative structure, takes the form of what is essentially a transcendental structure. That is to say, if temporality is a relation between past, present, and future, okay, temporality only acquires meaning when that relation between past, present, and future is narrated or put into the form of a set of narrative relations. Yeah? This, this is the sense in which uh, in recurs time and narrative. Right? He says there is no time without narrative. And that's the basis of scale. In other words, narrativity is fundamental. It's not fundamental to time, it's fundamental to meaningful time. It's fundamental to time to which we can give various sorts of meaning. And the two primary forms, the two culturally and philosophically primary forms of narrative meaning are fictional and historical narrative. Yeah. But at the level of their general narrativity, 
they share famously various narrative structures. Because of course history as a uh, as a discursive genre emerges out of the same narrative form as fictional narrative, which is the oral story. Right? Oral storytelling. Yeah? In other words, there's, there's one practice which gives rise uh, in the course uh, of the late Middle Ages in Europe to what we now think of the discrete genres uh, of uh, fiction and history, which are narrative which have, which have, have different truth uh, conditions, uh, among other things. Now, what I want to suggest in relation to uh, the work, which I'll just close by sharing a clip of, uh, is is something that, it, that is also a work, as I said, in the Atlas Group. And in relation to an aspect of the work of the Atlas Group, which I haven't, which I haven't written about and didn't write about, I talked about the questions of fictionality and contemporaneity and collectivity, which is the way in which this is work which is grounded uh, in, in modern instances of classically oral storytelling. In other words, if I were to write now, I mean, I wrote about the Atlas Group, you know, formally in its fictional existence between 99 and 2005. If I were to write now about the practice of Wally Broad, of which you know, the Atlas Group was a moment, I think one would, in order to unify that practice uh, across the difference between Wally Broad and the Atlas Group, one would have to make the concept of storytelling basic, and one would have to make its performances basic, I think, to this work increasingly. You know? I mean, I think that's increasingly clear uh, relative to the kind of work he shows now, which is, in a way, increasingly parasitic upon the performances, the performances that accompany them, even when you know, they're not taking place, right? we need to, in some sense, reconstruct the narrative. And it also happens in relation to Sartari's uh, so, so work, and particularly the work which was the work that was in Venice, uh, which is also in Brussels, uh, which is the letter of a refusing pilot, which is a work which, in some sense, redeems the history of an oral narrative, takes the instance of a particular oral narrative that was, um, if you like, passed on for a number of years before becoming subjected to uh, like the truth conditions of documentary at the point at which the identification of the figure in the narrative as a literal historical individual became, became possible and then like, that narrative can be retold in a different way. And the same thing happens uh, in a different way in relation to uh, In This House, the 2005 film. So I'm just going to show a tiny bit of it. Just give us something to talk about.
file that allowed themselves to be recorded. Okay? So they appear as audio files. Um, what this means is it means that there's a kind of priority of morality uh, narratologically within the construction of this, this video. Uh, it also means, if you like, you can also see, <coughs> sorry, you can also see, if you like, this, the way in which this is inserted as an articulating element into a work that has the inorganic structure of a constructivist work. Because the self-sufficiency of each of the elements of the work, which is, if you like, the condition, the difference between an in inorganic and an inorganic work, is the relative self-sufficiency of each of the elements. The work retains its constructivist form because of the relative self-sufficiency of each element, which is, if you like, visually staged by this, um, by this uh, <coughs> way in which you get the relation between this image uh, and, and subtitle. But maybe, um, I think maybe I've said enough. I've gone on for ages. I apologize. <laughs> from a potentially infinite range of artistic materials, nonetheless, whatever you select comes to you uh, conditioned by history in various ways. Um, and what you the meaning of what you produced will, in various ways, be produced by the viewer's relation to the way in which those conditions are mediated by your work. So, in a sense, you have no choice, okay? You only have the decision whether the decision of, if you like, the degree to which you, your practice benefits from reflectively incorporating a certain consciousness of your relation to those historical conditions uh, and those in which, if you like, you, you don't believe your practice does. Because obviously there are practices that do not benefit from their own historical self-consciousness. Right? Um, I mean, historically, I mean, painting would be one, right? Um, a certain kind. I mean, historically, we often get artists that come to our MA in our, in our, in our center, in our MA in aesthetics and art theory. And we used to get quite a few painters, but the painters don't come anymore, the word is out, it's a bad idea. Um, but when we got quite a lot of painters, often, normally around about week four or five, 
they would come to see me and say, I've stopped painting. Right? And I would say, great. Right? Uh, and, and they would be quite unhappy in some ways. And I'd talk through the fact that really they, you know, they needed to stop painting maybe for a year now, and then they could paint again, and maybe a different way, maybe not, whatever. But that it wasn't a bad thing that they'd stop painting. Right? And I, I don't mean this only in a sarcastic way, that one of the good things I think we do in the Centre of Research in Modern Philosophy is stop people painting. Um, <laughs> but I don't really mean that in a, in a sarcastic way, I also mean it in a... I think there's significance to that, right? I mean, because there's some things you can't do with a certain level of self-consciousness, right? So, I don't, so self-consciousness is not necessarily the criterion, but it is the criterion in relation to a certain, a certain kind of work which is, if you like, demanded by a certain state of artistic materials, particularly a certain technological state of artistic materials. And I guess my own kind of crudely avant-garde position would be that you know, those are the practices which are, if you like, in some sense, most contemporary in the historical sense. Because they're the practices in which you have to approach the question of the artistic appropriation of the latest technologies. And the question of, if you like, what's the difference between the old use of those technologies and generalized social uses of those technologies. And then you can't really do that in the... You don't have the history of practice which allows that to have been learned in such a way that it can become intuitive. Right? I mean, our practices that have very long histories and very long histories of practice and being taught and, you know, can, can embed certain practical decisions at intuitive levels, but in relation to new technologies, you, it's harder to do that, right? I mean, there's much more on the line all the time that you have to think about, you know, whether you, you, whether you should be using that technology, whether it's a, that is a viable artistic material, whether you're doing something brilliant and original like you think or something embarrassing and obvious, you know, you know yeah, you have to make those. You have to be, if you're not self-conscious of those decisions, you're going to be in trouble. Right? Peter, I just wanted, in relation to the list of uh, approaches to uh, narrativizing and documenting our art, art history, our criticism, aesthetics, philosophies of art, um, where you placed um, Alice Manifesto is considering Adorno's high valuation of those in the aesthetic theory as an aesthetics of the 20th century. But artist also artist manifestos or artist writings? Artist manifestos. Mm. And just in relation to Adorno's uh, claim for them. Yeah. But then also that strange other form, tech scores or event scores, which yeah. seem to occupy yeah. a, a, another territory in midst of that. Well, I think of tech scores and event scores as types of work. I mean, I think that's a, that's an, I think of them as an artistic form. Yeah. Um, I mean, an artistic form that, you know, degenerated, degenerated as soon as people became self-conscious of it as a genre, right? So it's much harder to use, um, given the fact that it's become, it's no, in a way, it's no longer a form, it's, a kind of, it's almost become a style. Um, manifestos are different because they're, in a sense, their art status derives from their literary form, okay? Um, so that they, I mean, you know, they, they are an artistic form and they're a genre, but in relation to literature, uh, right, so that, you know, one of the things that one of the things that's at stake here, which I, I didn't have time to talk about, uh, is the peculiar history of separation and overlapping and reseparation and <coughs> convergence uh, of the concepts of art uh, and literature, right? Because in the, in the tradition that we're, uh, you know, I'm locating this in, like the broad post mid 18th century Western institutionalized modern art tradition, subsequently um, internationalized, art becomes a philosophical concept via the generalization of the concept of uh, poetry, by right, in Romanticism, which retroactively becomes described as literature and then later writing. Um, 
One of the peculiar things that happens in the course of the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, which really is a late 19th century phenomenon, uh, is that once uh, literature departments are founded in universities, uh, literature uh, separates itself off from the visual arts, if you like, at the level of the discursive constitution of the concept of art. And art increasingly becomes synonymous you know, with the Beaux Arts, right? With the catastrophically misdescribed fine arts. Um, and if you like, there's a, there's a, there are theoretical and critical problems, in a way, from that moment onwards, because art in its generality is modeled on literature. But its generality, after the two-thirds of the way through the 19th century, becomes manifest in the form of the alleged unity of what was then the, the beautiful arts, and which you know, has become in some way the visual arts, insofar as that's a, or some people you know, want to call it the spatial arts. The whole question uh, of that unity is problematic because it's the unity of a general concept which is being applied to the generality minus literature. Yeah? Um, and of course, then the function of Greenbergian modernism was to try to theoretically absolutize the separation, right? was to theorize and absolutize the separation, to make the separation transcendental. Um, but of course, to make the separation transcendental, he had to purify the visual arts of temporal aspects, which was a brief and doomed project, right? Um, so, as soon as you get in a film and video being, if you like, the main constitutive practices, the whole relation to, to the concept of literature has become peculiar and, uh, and sustains itself in a way in a place where it doesn't belong. It sustains itself. You know, we're at the level of the materiality, historically, between the level of the materiality of the book, the differing materiality and modes of reproduction of the book, from the materiality and modes of reproduction, the visuality of photography and film. But at the level, if you like, of transcendental narrativity, there's an indifference between those. And in a sense, what I'm talking about is, if you like, the unconscious return of these elements of transcendental narrativity, which derive uh, from the concept of literature, which constituted the concept of art in the late 18th century, back into contemporary art. Um, because, of course, the thing that is most humorous, you know, is, is, that, the, is that people rename the institutions begun to rename the beautiful arts, which obviously they couldn't call beautiful anymore because they haven't been beautiful for a long time. Um, the visual arts, but they called them the visual arts precisely at the moment in which they weren't visual either. Right? Um, so the visual arts was just as bad a label as the beautiful arts because these arts were neither visual nor beautiful primarily. At least if you take conceptual art to be if you like a constitutive break, which is what the narrative that I want to tell does do. <coughs> Okay, I've got is, is this working? Okay. Um, I was struck by how you put um, narrative as the transcendental point of indifference between fiction and history. And when you said that, I was interested in why you use the term point of indifference, but also if the narrative <coughs> takes that transcendental role, what happens to the unnarratable? Uh, what kind of status the unnarratable might have? And that's linked to another question in what you said pretty soon after that. In terms of the philosophical criticism of contemporary art, you know, you um, listed these three categories of philosophy, history, and the contemporary. And I wondered what happened in relation to those three categories to the possibility of the non-historical in relation to art. Whether for you, art is entirely historicized or historical. It can be saturated, as it were, by history. 
and that having narrativity as a sort of transcendental, in a sense, uh, perhaps guarantees that, and maybe ultimately guarantees the intelligibility of that. And so, for me, that would be a problem. That would be a problem in relation, in terms of Adorno, in relation to the notion of the non-identical, specifically. Yeah. And the idea that somehow the, the telos can be towards um, subjective freedom, because isn't for Adorno subjective freedom also always already a kind of oppression of the non-identical. So it has to be undone in relation to the work through dissonance or whatever, or through some idea of the materiality of the work. And that, that notion of materiality might then bring back the idea of an essential non-historical constituent to the work of art, which we could name other things. We could name it also uh, Earth in Heidegger, or oh, contingency, or, or whatever. And then that then makes a problem of your exclusion, or makes it too easy for you ex to exclude something like speculative realism. Because in a way, speculative realism, you could say, is the rebound of some kind of real or uh, non-identical in relation to the work of art. So that your, your position, if I'm characterizing it correctly, is in a kind of anti no an antinomy relation to speculative realism. No, no, this is kind of speculative realism to begin with. I mean, the problem, I'm not defending it. There's two problems, problems. There's two problems with speculative realism. I mean, one is a philosophical problem, which is that it's it's a it's a position that's hard to take seriously philosophically when read in relation to the history of philosophy. But that's a that's a philosopher's problem. Um, in a way, the, the art world problem with speculative realism is has absolutely nothing to say about art. Right. What it does if art is not entirely historical no, 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 and subjective. No, it doesn't have anything to say about art <laughs> unless there's no difference between art, unless there's no difference between art and not art. Because it's not enough, it's not enough, if you like, to philosophically absolutize the non-art element and talk about it, because the meaning of the non-art element in art, which is, which is obviously increasing historically and is important in art, Okay, isn't self-sufficient and can't be expounded at the level of a speculative realism and a kind of schoolboy metaphysics of objects. Um, that, that, that can't be treated like that self-sufficiently because its artistic meaning derives from its relation to the other elements, right? So it's completely undialectical. So it only functions, if you like, via the obliteration of the concept of art. Now, the obliteration of the concept of art obviously is an option, right? But it's not an option if you want to keep art practices or art institutions or anything else, right? Um, anyway, respective reason. Yeah, we've really 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 spent really really too long with respective reason. Um, <laughs> but it might be, have something to do with the coming back of the non-historical, non-subjective dimension, yeah. even in an yeah. inadequate but, form. But there's, there's two different, there's a number of different things here with, to do with the structure of the work of art on Adorno's account. On Adorno, Adorno's account is of the work of art, the ontological structure of the work of art, uh, is a series of, if you like, layers of what he calls double character. Okay, so uh, it, it's, it's made up ontologically of a series of contradictory layers that appear, if you like, in relation to contradictory conceptual oppositions. So this notion of double character, this doppel character, is obviously taken from, okay, Marx's capital, where he introduces the commodity as the double character of the commodity in use value and exchange value, right? So that the whole concept of the work of art is modeled on this concept of double character that he takes from one of capital. But of the, of the many, if you like, the main ones relevant to us here are the relationship between autonomy and, and social fact, right, which presents itself as antinomically as an opposition, but turns out to be a dialectical identity because the social fact of art is the basis of its autonomy. Right? In other words, the process of the separation of art from other social practices and its institutionalization 
and ask precisely in sociality is the condition of autonomy. So each of these things turn into dialectical relations. But the relevant one that I draw attention to is this relation to, between its subject matter quality and its thing like quality. Okay? And, and each, uh, they're the opposite of each other, but they're also the condition for the art function of each other. Okay? So it's, it's, it's subject like because of its capacity to produce the illusion that it's like a subject. Okay? And it's thing like because uh, it relates to the moment of materiality as, if you like, a moment of uh, opacity. Okay? So it's, it's, it's thing-like in the traditional philosophical sense of the thing, uh, which you get from you know, Kant through Heidegger to Lacan, where thing does not mean object. Okay? Thing is the philosophically completely different from object. Object is a concept constituted in relation to subject. Okay? There is no object without a subject. <coughs> Things, on the other hand, are constituted by their uh, ontological self-sufficiency. And consequently, they fail to give themselves completely to objects. So thing is the word for the uh, opacity of the materiality of the work of art. Yeah? Okay? And it's only because uh, Work of art, works of art present themselves as things, that is to say, <coughs> with a certain opacity, that they can present themselves as subject-like, okay, because their self-sufficiency is modeled on the self-sufficiency of the thing. This is the sense in which reification, which is like a bad term for <coughs> theorists in relation to uh, commodification and cultural commodities, is a good thing in relation to the work of art, because for Adorno, reification is the basis of the autonomy of art. Because it's the thing-like quality of the work which refuses the subject, okay, which allows the work to produce the illusion of its self-sufficiency. So only on the basis of its thing-like quality can it appear to act like a subject. That's the first thing. The second thing is, when it acts like a subject, yeah, the concept of subject, which is at stake here, is, if you like, the main philosophical concept of the subject that you get from Kant onwards, and which you also get in those discourses which are supposed to be critiques of the subject or dissolutions of the subject, like structuralism, which is the concept of the subject as the point of origin of an action. Right? In this case, the illusory point of origin of the production of meaning. Okay? So you could give a completely orthodox structuralist account of the subject like uh, quality of the work of art. You could take Jacques Millet's classic definition of the subject as the action of a structure. No? This is the classic structuralist text on the subject. The subject is the action of a structure or the name for the empty place okay, within the structure uh, from which the structure acts. So the subject is names, if you like, names a causality that has no origin causality is structural and relational, right? So it's an illusion. So the, the work of art is precisely like the structuralist concept of a subject, right? It behaves, but like it produces the illusion of independent subjectivity in exactly the same way that structures, by virtue of their action, produce the illusion uh, of subjects. Um, but in the work of art, the thing that is the opposite of that, which is the thing-like quality, is the ontological condition for it doing that, because only the thing like quality allows it to project itself uh, as ontologically self sufficient. And that concept of subject yeah, is the same concept, but in a different way from, if you like, the bad subjective freedom you refer to. Because the kind of subjective freedom for a daughter that is bad is the kind of freedom which is based on the determination of intuition by concept. So in bad subjective freedom, subject equals concept, right? But in good artistic freedom, subject equals name for the action of the structure of the artwork. Um, well, I don't quite agree with that interpretation of the dawn. Are you equating the opacity with the thing-like quality? The, opac the opacity is the consequence of the thing-like quality. Uh, which I have a sort of bit of a, and the, if the thing-like quality is it's a condition for the autonomy, I have a problem with that because I mean Adorno also talks about the repression of nature or nature within and without. I don't think the subject is 
undivided, as it were, in no, no, in no, 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 even in, a, in, even in Adorno's terms, yeah, because, because there is no non-identical in the name of which. But there's no concept. Uh, 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 there's uh, no concept. It, that it's not. It's not a relation between concept and intuition. It's a. It's a, It's the. That. It's the production. Of yeah, it's the non-identical. Non identical is neither. <laughs> <laughs> neither concept nor intuition. Right. Right. It's what needs to be a deed in a sense. No identity. I haven't even asked my question about temporality. <laughs> <laughs> no identity is the epistemological term. Okay. So no identity is all you can say epistemologically. Okay. But art can say a lot more because it's not epistemology. That's the advantage. I think there's also a problem with time, but I'll come back to that after some other questions. <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> what do I say now? Um, uh, just to add, like, a problematic in, in terms of the reification is what happens then is it becomes like commodity fetish, which I think is extracted from your reading, which I don't think is a good aspect of contemporary art. But anyway, I want to ask you about um, your speculation on the future death of art schools that you briefly mentioned. <laughs> you want me to say something else about that? Yeah, well, I didn't really get what you said about it. Well, other than it's tied to the commodity, really. Um, it, 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 it's simply tied to the, uh, the increasing uh, integration of all previously public institutional forms with their own historical and social rationality to, um, to market logics, really. I mean, whereas if you like art schools and public art institutions had discrete uh, logics, that didn't mean that the artworks that circulated through them weren't commodities. The artworks, all the artworks are commodities. The daughter's not worried about artworks being commodities. The question is how you are a commodity, right? Uh, and and the, the question is, if you like, how the artwork, individual artwork relates to its own commodity status. The, the critical artwork on Adorno's model redeems its own fetish character. Okay? So the, the critical artwork is the good fetish. Okay? It redeems ratification. Because basically what, what Adorno's reply to Benjamin was, was in a sense, like he embraced the commodity form as the condition for a certain kind of interpretation generally. And Adorno's reply is essentially, you can only redeem the ratification of the commodity with autonomous art. You can't redeem it with other cultural forms. Um, and of course, but that redemption is what's a threat in relation to these market logics, um, particularly in, uh, in these kind of new international networks of art schools, right? Um, which are all related to, to specific markets and things like that. <laughs> and no, I've been advised to keep this short and I'm not particularly good at that, so <laughs> let's see what I can do. Um, because I think it is very complicated and it, this is a, a following on some of the complications that Michael, Michael Hibben here was, was addressing, I think. Um, so we'll see what I can do with this and try and condense it in some way. Um, obviously some of the terms that are used, some of the vocabularies that have been used have very different nuances depending on which philosophical inflection one might have. So for example, if you're approaching this from a Spinoza, Nietzsche, Bergsonian, Deleuzean perspective, and thinking about time and narrativity or anti-narrativity from that perspective, then the terms you're using, whether it's the idea of generality and the creation of concepts, narrativity, the idea of the event, an event being something that moves time on, as you said, which would be questioned or contested by a lot of people who philosophize about the event. All of these terms are, are, are very contested in that sense. They're complicated terms because depending, as I said, where you're coming from, they, they, they vary a lot of that. But what I wanted to bring up really was this idea of the instrumentalization of the fictional and narrativity very recently in the art world, how certain vocabularies have emerged and are being used 
in, in what I would say is a very instrumentalized way. And what that says about the relationship between histories of time and temporality and the relationship between certain effective paradigms from literature um, leading into the arts world and how they function within that mode. I'm thinking especially, I mean, if you're thinking about anti-narrativity and you're thinking about, say, Borges, Proust, and artists, maybe like Stan Douglas in the past, who has used very much Proust, and David Herbu maybe as well, who, who has used uh, Proust and Borges a lot. I'm thinking about, you know, artists who, who complexify or complicate uh, different theories of time in a very specific way and also complicate this, this idea of narrativity because I think the easiness with which certain vocabularies are penetrating the art world to do with the fictional, to do with this uh, pretending to forget almost of how much that was torn apart and undone and dismantled within modernism is to me quite uh, fascinating. Um, troubling, I have to say as well because it seems to be too easy in, in some sense, but it is quite fascinating how, how those vocabularies have emerged and that idea of the performative, dramaturgy, and the, the vocabulary of narration has re-emerged in the art world in a very specific moment. Well, I mean, it, I'm just offering you one, if you like, one philosophical tradition's take on that. I, I'm just integrating it into a particular philosophical narrative. I mean, I could give you a critique of the other ones, but I don't know. <laughs> I've drunk so much water. <laughs> well, well, what do you say? Just because are the are, are, are the MFA students doing another fundraiser tonight in the studios? Or not? No. Okay. I'll try and persuade people to come for a drink in the bar. What's the Glory Grove? I don't know what it's called. Not the Mark Wisdom, the smart one. <laughs> yeah, you cross now. So I'll stop for I'll stop for a bit, uh, and I'll try and persuade you to come to it. I'm just making use of this break um, to inform you that we uh, finally managed to found the Art Networking Society last uh, Saturday. Uh, we're going to have the first event on Tuesday, which is tomorrow, at 7 p.m. in the curating studio in Lorry Bath. And there will be a second event on the 25th, so basically the Tuesday afterwards. And I hope to see you all there. I will hand out these flyers and put a little bit of information on it. Okay, thank you. side which I rather enjoyed about, um, I think you said something about maybe commentators, critics, cultural theorists um, over reading minor cultural artifacts. Uh, I think we know who you mean. Um, and you, you queued that up um, in terms of a disagreement you sketched between Adorno and Benjamin um, where you portray Benjamin as um, rendering the work um, open and autonomous because of the open reading that the interpreter can bring to it, um, and contrasted that with Adorno's notion of a kind of embeddedness in um, autonomy providing institutional frameworks. Okay, so um, can you say a bit more about the boundaries of those those free readings? Because on, I mean, on one one way of approaching it would be that artists are routinely given the license to bring radically open readings to all kinds of experiences and fragments and narrative data or lecture, um, whereas you're refusing that freedom to those commentators you're critiquing. Um, so, uh, and I guess what I wanted to link that to is in the book, um, the confidence with which you distinguish between art and non-art. And what's striking in the book, um, which I hugely enjoy, is that nonetheless, um, you, on the one hand, you tend to 
congratulate artworks for confronting what you call art with non-art. Um, but on the other hand, you seem to have no doubts at all about the difference between art and non-art. This seems curious to me. Um, and th this goes back to my this goes back to my earlier answer in relation to why speculative realism realism realists shouldn't be allowed to just talk about the non-art bit of art. Um, the the Adorno Benjamin relationship is very complicated because you know while Benjamin's alive, you know, Adorno essentially does two things. Uh, one is he plagiarizes him, uh, and the other is he constantly criticizes him. Right. Um, once Benjamin dies, I don't know if you like, and develops a more systematic philosophical position, uh, epistemologically in relation to the theory of art. He, um, he incorporates more or less the whole of Benjamin, if you like, refigured into his theory. Um, so in a way, it, there's some, but you know, most of what of the philosophical content of Leigh and Adorno is Benjamin. And interestingly, is often precisely the Benjamin he was criticizing when Benjamin was alive, right? Like the question of the redemption uh, reification, for example, which was a kind of outrageous impossibility in 1935. But by the 60s, had become the basis of the work of art. Um, so that, that's, a peculiar, that's, that's a peculiar relation. Um, I'm not sure what you mean when you said, well, you know, artists like to interpret lots of things in different ways. I mean, I'm talking about critical discourses and interpretation. Yeah? I mean, if you're talking about it, if you like, the way that they incorporate interpretations of various things freely into their practice, then to me that's a completely different thing. Anyone can take anything and interpret, you know incorporated into their practice. That the, um, if you like, the, the intellectual criterion to which you subject theoretical discourse is not a criterion to which you subject theoretical discourses to be used by artist, as artistic material by artists, right? Because they're, they're, they're appropriating those discourses and subjecting them to the logic of the work. So the issue there is what their relation to the logic of the work is not what their anything about the self-sufficiency of the discourse. Right? So you know the fact that Kasuth is all you know, is wrong in stupid ways about Kant or whatever is not the point. Right? Um, the fact that he thinks it's the point is the point. <laughs> um, and being wrong is not the point. I mean it should be relevant, but it's not irrelevant because he doesn't think it's irrelevant. But that's his mistake. Um, in relation to art and non-art, I don't think that I'm so confident in, I'm confident that we need to distinguish between art and non-art, right? I'm not confident in any particular instance that I personally can, right? I mean, yeah. I mean in other words, I think the system needs that distinction. The, the, dis the judgment in relation to in individual works has become harder as art has constituted itself as art increasingly via strategies of, on, of indifference to non art. Right? I mean, Adorno has a narrative about this, which is essentially that if you like, the ideological and compensatory function of art derives from the idea that it posits itself as a possible freedom. In existing society, yeah, and that those are, in other words, the more wholly autonomous it looks, the more uncritical it is, and the less autonomous it is, right? So on, on Adorno's account, the history of late modernism and, and into more recent art is the history of the increasing. This is the whole narrative of aesthetic theory. Is the history uh, of the growth of the non-art component within art, and that the non-art component is increasingly constitutive of the artistic character of the whole. Right? In other words, art increasingly needs non-art in order to be art. The question is, what's the relation to its non-art status once it's been incorporated? Because the logic of the constructivist work demands 
that it remain relatively independent to continue to function. Okay? Um, and that's that for that's one of the main dilemmas that Adorno is wrestling with in the 60s. The question of what he calls literality or facticity, factuality, not facticity, it's still like it. I mean, which in a way it's the same, it's the Michael Fried problem in a bit another tradition, right? Um, that's you know, that's the issue. Um, but what, you, what you've got to remember is that Adorno has a has a critical concept of art. So circulating as an object within the institutions of the art world, being traded as art or shown in museums, is not enough. Yeah, that's the condition of possibility of art. Right? In order to function as art, it has to critically function autonomously. And that's harder. Right? So most of the things that are circulating as art are not meeting the philosophical criterion of art here. Right? Precisely because they've been unable to uh, in some way negotiate the incorporation of non-art elements into art without being able to if you like, register a real a significant rearticulation which renders the work if you like, in some way different from the literal practicity. But of course, you know, there being no difference has long been a strategy, right? Okay, but then there always is a difference. Um, the question is whether the difference is significant, right? But that's, you have to make that, that's a judgment about individual works. Okay. But that's different, that non-art thing is different to, um, to Michael's, you know, unrateable stuff. Because that's more, more primal. The, you know, the underratable has been part of modernist narrative since the beginning of the 20th century. You know? The underratable is just the dialectical other of narration, which is, I mean, it's, it's completely conceptually dependent on. Yeah. Uh, before I give the mic, I'm back to Michael. So anyway, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> Just on, on that last point, um, do you think, um, this probably isn't of general massive importance, but do you think you can make a, con a connection between this kind of um, art commodity that circulates, uh, you know, circulates, let's say, non-art content without significantly uh, putting in question the art, non-art distinction or significantly working it, right? Can we make a chronology between, sorry, can we make an analogy between uh, that art commodity and uh, the commodity that is non-reproduced like in, in more generally. So um, let's say this is a failure of art to take place in the form of the art commodity. It, it does the institutional side, it doesn't do this kind of, whatever you want to call it, this kind of more self-reflexive and critical side. Is, yeah, is that analogous to the, the sort of broader adulteration or non-reproduction commodities that Marx, for example, talked about when he analyzes uh, the bread manufacture process in the 19th century uh, is only useful to be gained by approaching an aesthetic uh, sort of failure, if you like, uh, in, in terms of production and reproduction like that. Um, well, I mean, a couple of things. One, one is that the, the art, non-art distinction, which, which was initially exploited, if you like, at the level of visible materiality, is no longer exploited at the level of visible materiality. In other words, that's not... Uh, that's no longer, it's no longer easy to, to, to use something immediately materially different, physically materially different. So that the, so the, the, the non-art, the art non-art distinction becomes a question of the way uh, certain elements of the work function within the work, right? And then the non-art elements would be the elements which within the you know, non-organic constructivist work retain sufficient self-sufficiency uh, in relation to their original function, if you like, where they came from as materials, other given uses of those materials to, if you like, register those practices within the work in such a way as they, they appear as non-autonomous. Yeah. So that the non-I element in some ways is the non-autonomous element. Yeah. It's the mode of existence autonomy. I mean, the question of commodification is, is tricky. I mean, Adorno is much misunderstood on this. There's a kind of, Jameson is mainly to blame, as he is for many things. Um, the 
because there's a tendency to think that Adorno has this distinction between uh, autonomous art and the culture industry, uh, high art, and, and that high art is autonomous, uh, and the culture industry is commodified. Right? But that was never his distinction, not even in the 1930s was that his distinction. The distinction between autonomous art and the culture industry is the distinction between two different kinds of commodification. Okay? Art has always been commodified. Commodification is, if you like, one of the institutional modes of its autonomy in the 18th and 19th centuries. So that autonomous art is art, the commodity character of which does not supervene over its non-commodity character. So in Marx's terms, uh, autonomous art is formally subsumed to the commodity form, but cultural industrial art is really subsumed in terms of the distinction between formal and real subsumption. So that's a distinction which is internal to the commodity form. It's not a distinction between art and commodities. Uh, it's because that distinction is internal to the commodity form that the question of the commodity is, in some sense, so problematic for autonomous art. Right? Precisely because not only it is, is it autonomous, commodified, but because of its dependence on the fetish character of the commodity form, for its reification, yeah. it's dependent on it for its autonomy. Um, so it can't uh, escape the commodity character. What it has to try to do uh, is stop the commodity character over determining the logic of its production. Right? Yeah, but I mean, this is why I was using the terms reproduction and non-reproduction. Yeah. Because, I mean, once you've accepted that the art is, the art is born commodity, and, and I, I, I totally take your point about the formal real subsumption distinction. I mean, all I'm trying to say is that when art goes from being formally subsumed into really subsumed, right, art that's produced in the art institution. Well, I think when it's, really, that when it's really, when it, if it's really subsumed, I think just tautologically, it's, it's, it's not functioning autonomously. I mean, unless it happens to be using, unless that's a misdescription and it's real subsumption, is, if you like, part of an artistic strategy on which it has a second reflection. If you, you know, so the you know, coons or something, right? Where, where the, the, you know, the various artists use real subsumption as itself, you know, a strategic practice within the work. And then, but then you have to ask the question of the way that that, whether that practice, you know, is working you know, in a certain way or not. Right? Uh, but obviously, that, that's that's a quite a common strategy since the 60s, um, in some way. Okay, well, I can see you won't be drawn into my web of reproduction. And well, <laughs> reproduction is more, um, uh, reproduction is more difficult because re reproduction is essentially about the afterlife of the work, right? Uh, re reproduction is really about the way that the work is transformed by the history of its reception and then ontologically retroactively redefined by that history of reception uh, as that which, if you like, would have that history of reception. I mean, that's a kind of Benjaminian problematic. I mean, what's interesting about Adorno's aesthetic theory is it's a kind of pure productivist aesthetic uh, in some way. Um, and weirdly, or that despite Benjamin's productivism, formally and historically speaking, Benjamin's is actually an aesthetic of reception um, because of the, the constitutive character of the concept of afterlife in the ontology of cultural commodities. Adorno just has a kind of Valerian you know, relation to reception, which is, which is the only significant the constitutive things about reception are to do with the fact that the way that few, the way that in order to become critical, you have you know, a modern work has to kill old works, and, and works will themselves be killed by new works. So, living and dying, right, you know, is, is the kind of categorical schema for reception here. Right? Um, so, reproduction is in a sense avoiding death by future work. <laughs> um, it's, it's a sort of negative concept. Um, Death is where I wanted to come in. I mean, this is, this is what uh, John, John Roberts would say, you know, that is the, the kind of standard that uh, art continually poses for any, you know, the existing art stands, uh, poses for any 
new uh, artistic act, right? So this kind of the sense of the socially necessary labour time uh, of a commodity is sort of mapped across into art in terms of whether art does manage to destroy enough the existing art, right? The existing, I don't know if that's even like a kind of quantum of art. But, um, so, so the problem is it's qualitative, not quantitative, that's the problem. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Can I come in just with a quick question on this plane? Because it's, it was your final move, and I think there is an issue around yeah, it. I'll reply to it by replying to the Deleuzean point that I didn't make the reply to, which I just did. But let me just put the question, because it's not so much about the, the dialectic of the unnarratable, but the narration of the un, undialecticizable. I mean, you, you made the distinction between Aristotelian time and temporality, and then you made the distinction between the fictional and the historical, it seemed to be within phenomenological temporality, and, and for you the issue seems to lie there. Now, if I remember Recur rightly, what Recur says about narrative is it's the way of mediating um, non-phenomenological time with lived or phenomenological time. So one could then associate Aristotelian time, say, with cosmic time or the time that's indifferent to us. So time, you know, as it were, outside the phenomenological. Yeah. And I think you, if you if you took the narrative in and storytelling in terms of, say, the Atlas group, in that, from that point of view, you'd come up with a very different interpretation because you then could say that narrativity in, in the Atlas group work is about the relation, you know, in a war context to death and destruction of the stories one tells in relation to that. So it's in relation to non-phenomenological dimensions of time that would involve death, aging, etc. Yeah, so but but um, uh, narration performs two mediating functions in Recur. Uh, one is internal to the philosophy of time, uh, in which, as you say, in narrative, narrativity mediates cosmological and phenomenological time. Okay. The primary function, the transcendental function of narrativity uh, within the structure of the book as a whole is to mediate the philosophy of time as a whole within the poetics of narrative. That's to say, it's to, it's to mediate uh, philosophical, with, if you like, non-philosophical discourses about time. Uh, and this is where the volume changes in volume three, and you get it. He wrote volume three is very different from the original plan for volume three because once uh, once narrative has acquired a double rather than a single mediating function, it has to uh, it has to perform the second mediation by virtue of the way in which it performs the first mediation. Okay, and that gives it an exteriority to uh, if you like philosophical uh, conceptions of time, so that the which is much deeper, if you like, than the exteriority of cosmological time to subjective time. Okay? Because here there's, if you like, a mediation of philosophical time as a whole with non-philosophical time, which is the poetics of, of narrative. And that's where it performs its kind of, uh, its most transcendental function. But the question of di dialectic is relevant here because it, it's the, completely the issue in relation to the, you know, the Deleuzean controls of time and stuff. Because the, the issue here, in a way, in relation to the, you know, the history of 20th century European philosophy, I mean, what's at stake in these, I mean, although they're quite similar in various ways, but in, for example, the difference between Deleuzean and Adornian conceptions of the work of art is the manifestation at the level of the analysis of the concept of art of the difference between anti-dialectical philosophies of difference and negative dialectical philosophies, right? And what's at stake is, if you like, to what extent can you maintain a philosophy of difference you know, in an artistic interpretation without <coughs> it becoming dialecticizable you know, at one level um, by virtue of its opposition to a non-dialectical, uh, by virtue of being by virtue of it being undialectical and thereby dialectically opposed to a dialectic. I mean, this is done by having my colleague Gary Daniels. That's, that's dialecticizing it in itself. You know, yeah, right? but, the, but, the, but the point is, and the point that the Lerzins like Eric Hallias acknowledge, is that once you move to the level of the concept, you can't help but do that. Okay, all differences are dialecticizable at the level of the concept. So you have to keep concepts out of this. OK? 
Okay? But this becomes a problem in relation to the history of contemporary art because you essentially have to deny the conceptual aspect of art because if you accept a conceptual aspect to contemporary art, you have a dialecticizable element within the art. And that's the problem. And that's why, um, to his own, you know, to the chagrin of the sophisticated Deleuzean, um, Deleuze's Bacon book is kind of wild Merleau Ponty. He just becomes a phenomenologist of the non concept. Not at all. I have to disagree. And I'm just going to say this on the microphone. I have to say as well that that depends on your, your concept of the concept. In other words, depending on the concept. No, look, just, just, just could, you, could you continue that? And uh, we really should end the year. Um, and really, those of you who have remained, we've probably set a, a new record for this year, the duration of the lecture. Please thank Peter.